You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hey there, No Labels, No Limits podcast listeners. This is Sarah Box, your host. I am so happy to bring back one of the guests who's been one of your favorites. Um, The last time we talked was three years ago, December of 2019. Oh my goodness, the time goes. But let me share a quote from her, and then I'm going to tell you who she is, and we're going to get right into the conversation today. Her quote is that honesty matters as much as oxygen. Think about that because oxygen is pretty darn important. And we'll ask her why she says that. But our guest today is Dr. Carla Marie Manley. Now, many of you will remember her from that interview. And if you want to go back and check her out again, that was episode 97. So that's been a little while since we chatted. But Dr. Carla Manley is a clinical psychologist, a relationship expert, and she makes her home in the beautiful Sonoma County Coast area of California. In addition to her clinical practice, Dr. Manley is invested in her roles as an author, consultant, and a speaker. And on top of that, she's a meditation teacher, yoga instructor, and a lover of the natural world. And how great is it that she lives in a beautiful part of our country? And her personal passion and the way she lives her life inspires people to live out their dreams. And I think you'll see when we get into our conversation that um, Dr. Carla, as I like to refer to her, enjoys supporting others, but she has this direct and honest approach and a big dose of humor. So with that, let me welcome today's guest, Dr. Carla Marie Manley. Hey, Dr. Carla. Hello. Thanks for having me. Well, I, thanks for coming back, because I know, like I said, we don't always have our guests come back, but your episode um, was one of our very popular ones, which tells me that you struck a chord in our listeners' hearts, and it would make great sense to bring you back. And folks, before we hit record, um, Dr. Carla and I were just catching up a bit, chit-chatting, and we realized that we're really going to think about curiosity in this conversation today, even though we're talking about some other topics, we're going to wrap it it, and come at it through a lens of curiosity. So first, Dr. Carla, you know, one of the things that you share is that your, your own path has never been linear. And, you know, I'm curious, as the ninth child out of 10, tell us a little bit about your background and refresh those of us who've heard this or a version of it before. Quickly, I can tell you that, let's see, ninth child, family of 10, mom and dad were Catholic, both children of immigrants. Uh, You know, it it was a busy childhood. It was a chaotic childhood. And it was a childhood also where, um, particularly being a female, it was better that you be seen and not heard and, um, and that you walk the line and do what you're told. And so I did that for a really long time. And I was the, you know, the best girl I could be. And it came, you know, decades into my life, I decided to dismantle it and to become for the first time in my life who I wanted to be. And so took a lot of risks, made a lot of changes, including a divorce, um, not for the sake of divorce, because I think, you know, relationships can undergo huge monumental changes, but and still have a healthy partnership, but it was an unhealthy partnership to begin with. So you know, that ended and began my new life and have never looked back. I And I don't look back at my past with any sense of, oh, my God, poor me. I wish this hadn't happened or that hadn't happened. I'm at a point where and maybe it's, you know, the lens through which I see the world. I see that I am so much of a better human being for all the trials I've been through. I have so much more empathy and understanding and 
and humanity and curiosity that and such a passion because when you've been kept away from your passion for decades and then you're able to breathe into your passion and find your you know your soul family it is just it's like oxygen you okay know? let's yeah. let's slow that one down a bit for just a second two things i would like for us to dig deeper in that i'm super curious about one is when you say passion so these are the these are the things I want to dig into so I don't forget your passion, your soul family and oxygen. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about how you discovered your passion, you know, like evidently growing up, you knew like you were being squished and silenced. Your voice wasn't lifted up for you in that big old family. But how did you get from there to connecting with you, your core, your passion? Such a good question. And one of the things I learned in doctoral, in my doctoral program was that, and I really subscribe to the belief that we generally know when we're very young, what we want to be, what we want to do, and that it's socialized out of us. It is, we are, as you said, squished. It's just taken out of us. Some people are supported in it. Um, some just happen to be aligned with what their family or society sees happening for them. For me, I remember very young age, loving to write. Right, 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 right. I remember wanting to be a psychotherapist before I knew what one was. And um, I was told that I was too smart to be a therapist, and so even I was in law school, I left law school because I was, it wasn't working for me. And I became very physically ill as a result of not listening to myself. And then I did, you know, was so not appreciated by my family for trying to strike out on my own that um, I ended up working in an investment business that was very acceptable and much desired by my family. And so I did the right thing all the while hating it. And I don't use the word hate lightly, but it was a very difficult life where I did everything for everybody else. And I did a magnificent job making everybody happy, but I was miserable and finally got to the point where I was done being miserable and I was willing to, but all the time, for example, even before I did that, I left law school and enrolled in a master's program to get my master's degree in counseling psychology. My father was so disappointed that he wouldn't come to my graduation. I'm not sure anyone came to my graduation in my family. Maybe my mom did. Probably she did. But I more remember that my father didn't because it was so subpar, so to speak. So when I went back um, to my doctoral program, one of my sisters who is an MD, she was um, just tells you that the taint to being a psychologist was that she sent me a card that said, congratulations on your master's degree. She couldn't even bring herself to to honor the fact that I had become a doctor in my field. And so again, you can see the prejudice and the lack of curiosity about, so let's bring curiosity into it. It's about what happened. Of course, my parents had 10 kids, no blame, no shame on them. But what happened to somebody saying, what do you want to be, little Carla Marie? What do you want to breathe in into life? How can we help you be you? Right. And so now I use that lack of where I had to help other people breathe into their lives and say, what do you want? Be, let me be curious about you and what your needs are. And so I get to do that as, as my livelihood, which is fabulous. So and I think that that's where our passion comes from. We often know what it is or get little clues along the way. But someone or something says, oh, there are too many of that in that field. Or you wouldn't be good at that. Or there's not enough money in that. Or, oh, you'll never be successful at that. And all the while, we're having this little beautiful part of ourselves get smaller and smaller and smaller and more crushed. And so I try to, you know, my big part of my work is helping undo those messages so that people can get back to their essence. And I believe that's where our passion is. Our passion is in our essence of, of what we've, you know, there's a craving for life and a craving to do something and so many people in our society focus on making you know thinking that success that monetary you know um wealth is the end all be all but for many people that's and that's one of the things i love about my the clients i work with a lot of them and a lot of them are, are younger and i work with older clients as well but they're looking they're saying that's not you know my parents had that and they had horrible lives and empty lives i want to do it differently money is not my higher power so, so what, 
I want to get to the soul family. I haven't forgotten that. Yeah. But since you brought up the word success, how have you over the years redefined your definition of success versus the one that was laid on top of you when you were younger? And what are you seeing your clients share, particularly your younger clients, you know, share in terms of how they are viewing success through their um, experiences today? So, such such good questions. So success, you know, it's, <laughs> what a great question. It was being a good girl. It was being a good Catholic daughter. And how limiting is that? But I, I've never actually verbalized that before. That was the version of success in my family, being a good Catholic daughter. I do have to say my father did have a part of him where I remember him saying, and I want to give credit where credit's due, he did say, you know, I want you never having to depend on a man. I want you to be educated. You are talented. You are smart. So there was this push towards independence. And I did have some amazing role models, like my mom's stoicism. I lost a sister to Marfan syndrome who was blind. And first feminist I ever knew and she passed from a planet far too quickly and I just you know I look up at her now and say my goodness was she a magnificent role model an early role model and um unfortunately I was too young to understand it so I think that when you when, when I look at it and say success then it was being you know a good child now it's so different now it is showing up as me and doing the most good i can it's one of the reasons i write my books it's one of the reasons one of the big reasons i do what i do because i believe i'm on the planet to help people to help heal people to help change the world as my husband says one paragraph at a time and um i i really i really believe that that's what i'm here for and that's what I love. And to me, that's success because I am, I broke out of the mold and I am a very imperfect. And I love that I'm imperfect because it helps me really get other people, right? And and um, helps other people get me. But I really believe that when we are walking our talk, and that's what I try very hard to do is walk my talk. So there's almost, or let's say, let's hope there's nothing that I don't, offered to someone else that I'm not working on in my own life. Yep. And what about for your um, clients and their evolving definitions of success? Uh, I see it. And again, I don't want to make it just about Gen Z or millennials, but I really right. see it there. I do have to give a nod to, you know, the older population where I'm seeing a lot of people. There are definitely some people where success equals money equals whatever. Uh, but there are many of the older adults that I work with where they've been through a lifetime of chasing money, chasing success. And they're saying, wait, it's empty now, right? And so they're reconfiguring their lives. What I see with millennials and Gen Z is that there is such a willingness to back off of financial success as the priority and to say, wait a minute, it gives me great joy when I'm working with someone and we're talking about their priorities because I talk a lot about values and priorities in a very non-judgmental way. We just need to be curious. We need to know what these are. You know, what, what are yours? What are mine? What are yours? And then be able to breathe into them. And so it's interesting when I work with my older populations, often money is still a major thing. But for a lot of the younger group, money's not on their radar it's like yeah i want it but it's five it's number five number one is you often hear mental health relationship connection friendship being satisfied what huge paradigm shifts and so that's what and so i really and it's interesting because i was you know working with some clients this morning already and you know some of the the ones i was working with they are they are the ones where hey relationships i want i don't want to do what my parents did my parents toughed it out for 30 40 years hated each other yelled lived in silence i don't want that top on my list is having a healthy re relationship with my best friend so that we can live a happy life together. Well, and when you do that, you are less upset. What's interesting though about that is like when you say maybe money's down at number five, it's also when you were 
kind of checking off that little list, which I know is not inclusive of everybody, but each of those things is harder to measure because it's very subjective to the person, right? So satisfaction, the quality of my relationship. I mean, yes, there can be external values for that, but they're still very personal. Whereas you can say money is, you can measure how much or how little and in what degrees for what purposes. So it was interesting for me as you were listing those that all of a sudden there's a if I was thinking about the atmosphere, we've got the air and the, as it gets closer there, so if it's more dense, then you've got the layer of the earth and then it even gets more dense, right? So the money is that kind of divider thing. Um, but it's so interesting to see that because there is in the folks I work with too, Carla, it's the same thing. It's like, okay, I've been doing this job. I'm super successful in it, but something's off. Can't put my finger on it. And oftentimes it's the disconnect between the personal value system and what matters to them and the espoused business values. Yes. So what do we do with that? Let's bring curiosity into it, right? All right. And, we, and that's the piece when it's personal values and business values. And I'm actually a really good example of that. It's one of the reasons I didn't do well in the investment realm. Very different personal values very different personal values from that realm, which for me, it's all about honesty. It's about integrity. It's about kindness. It's about doing good for the world. Whereas investment is about, at least in that realm, was money matters and go for the money and forget about integrity. If it's if it's money or integrity, go for money. If it's money or respect, go for money. The default was money. And I think when we realize that something does not sit well with us. It's so important for us to become curious. Why is this? Why am I not thriving in this realm? Why am I not waking up wanting to go to work? Right? Be and it's generally because your values and priorities aren't in a good match. Not judging that piece over here where money is the end all be all. There are some people who really subscribe to that. But for someone who doesn't, then it becomes, no, this is just a, a, just like a an intimate relationship, right? A romantic relationship. We have to be, we don't have to be exactly matched. Sometimes it's great not to be exactly matched because we're learning more when there's some, you know, some rub, so to speak. But in a business environment, it's, I really believe that our romantic relationships and our business relationships aren't as disparate as we might think. I believe that the, that the principles in both are very similar. And for example, you look at honesty. For me, a business deal has to be based on honesty and trust. For me, an intimate relationship has to be based on honesty and trust. Same thing, business. We want agreements. This is an interesting piece right here. I love this piece. My fourth book, which is due out in about a year, I really get into this piece about agreements because in our intimate relationships, oh, I don't want to agree to that. I don't want agreements. I don't want to be constrained by that. And then I said, well, would you go into purchase a home or a car or even a pair of slacks without having a pair of jeans, without having an agreement about the price and how this is going to happen and what's expected of you? But people rail at that in relationships. And it's like, oh, we, we need to take it back to the basics. And so I think that there's so much more parity in those two realms that if we're living, to me, a, a really mindful life, an intentional life, that we want them to feel the same. We want them, of course, in our intimate relationships, we want the yumminess of vulnerability and emotional intimacy and sexuality and all of that. But a lot of the other paradigms are pretty much the same. So this is something that occurred to me as you were saying that about the um, agreements. And I think there can be a misconception that if we have agreements, quote unquote agreements in our relationship, it's somehow not romantic. It's not spur of the minute, you know, all of that. And yet when we have those agreements, it feels to me more spacious because now I don't have to worry about those things. It's like, we're in, we're good on that, right? We're solid. We're good. Uh-huh. 
And I 100% agree with you because it's exactly what the piece where people sometimes think an agreement is constraining, you're taking away my independence. No, you're taking a worry off the table and you're saying, and that's where the spaciousness comes from because we're saying, oh, well, just like you said perfectly, we're good on this. We know who's doing the dishes, everything from who's doing the dishes to how the bills are managed, right? And then once it's off the table, it's look at now we just have more space for connection. Yeah. We have less need to tussle or, you know, go through all of these passive aggressive techniques to get our needs met, right? And we're saying, wait a second, we have a deal, which is, you know, it's interesting. It's what people hate so much about like buying a car. They don't want to haggle. They don't want to go through that, that deal, right? Or what, or buying a home, the back and forth, it's, it's stressful. But once it's done, and you have the contract signs, spaciousness. Now I can do what I want with my car, with my home, my apartment, whatever it is. It's the same with our relationships. Yeah. If we, and that's the piece we're talking about, you know, my, my quote about honesty it, it is, you know, as important as oxygen. If you're going into a business or a romantic relationship or a friendship, and I've been on this side, I'm such an honest person that if I lied to you, you would know right away. I just, I'm not good at lying. It's just, I get so nervous about it. It's like, ah, right? I think that's not a character flaw. <laughs> it's that, I actually it's think it's asset. Really I, I learned that pretty early in life. We were on a little camping trip. I couldn't have been more than, I don't know, seven. And there was a Hershey bar missing from the bear locker, right? And everyone was in the tent in time out. And I came up, I was, I must, who knows where I was. And I came to my older sister. I said, why are you? They're in the tent. Somebody stole one of the Hershey bars for some more. And I said, oh, it was me, right? It's like, well, 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 I guess put me in time out. I don't know. So it's, and I can, and I can remember from childhood any time that I was dishonest, I can I think there were two or three times and I remember them. They're like stuck in my brain. Anyway, I think early on in life, that was one of my passions was honesty. And um, I can see how and in my work where when we're honest with ourselves and you know, one of the clients I was working this morning, was, it, was, it was a relationship issue and he couldn't quite how to get, get, figure out how to get it across to a significant other. He says, because you haven't been honest with yourself yet. Once you're able to be honest with yourself and really get into your voice, then you'll be able to breathe into her and speak to her in ways that she'll get. She'll get the authenticity. And so he had to get curious about what was going on inside, get really honest with himself. You could see his breathing change, his posture change, everything changed as he became more honest, more congruent with himself. And it just opened up the space in him and you could feel that he was going to be able to go and speak to her with greater ease and i think that that is just so and i've been on the side on the other side where there's you know i've had people be very dishonest with me and in those situations me being me i didn't pick it up until well too late and so i've had to work on trying to have better radar for that but i know how painful it is tremendously painful to be on the wrong side of honesty to have people be dishonest with you in life-changing ways and so I really work with helping people stand in their truth so that they can be honest with others for people who are suffering from being betrayed you know dishonesty to help them realize what their work is they can't we can't change when someone else is dishonest right we can change the impact on us and how, and how does that happen? Um, and I'm thinking, I mean, I, you know, one of the things that I've read that you said is that wellness and resilience, they're not by chance and that they're fostered by this awareness and courage and inner strength. So how do we create that aware, respectful relationship with ourselves that allows us that honesty? Don't we have to trust ourselves? Yes. And just for a moment, for, for listeners who might be thinking, oh, is this one of those things where you have to love yourself fully or trust yourself fully um, before you can do X, Y, or Z? I believe that all of this is work in progress. Mm -hmm. Trusting the self, work in progress. Loving the self, work in progress. So yes, it is about my last book, Date Smart, Transform Your Lives and Relationships, right? Or, What's it anyway? Something along those lines. Date smart, transform 
your relationships and love fearlessly. That's the, that's the subtitle. One of the big things I hit in there, and this answers your question. No, we often go into a relationship saying, what do I, what do I want in this partner? What do I want to get? What do I want to get? I say, uh, -uh let's start with what we can give. Let's turn the camera on us. And what that does, once we turn the camera on us and we're really looking, what do I have to give? I'm already doing self-work. I'm already doing self-honesty. And so that's the part where when we look at ourselves and say, well, wait, this is what I have to offer. I have these strengths. I have these frailties. I have these scared parts. I have these, you know, successful parts i have these broken parts you know whatever you want to call them and we look at them and go oh oh i have them and now and plus i have you know this to offer and my cooking skills to offer and my very terrible cleaning skills to offer whatever it might be right and when we realize wait a second i can offer this to someone i don't be ashamed of it no. but i know me and then I can show up and say, this is me. This is what I have to offer. Of course, we have to be careful, you know, the degree to which we're offering. Because we want to make sure the other person's safe and can appreciate that. And then we ask the other person to share the same. Honesty starts with self-honesty. This is who I am. All the good part, all the not so good part. And then we show up without apology. We may say, I'm working on this. I'm working not to shut down when I get sad, but this is a propensity I have. But when we're able to do that, can you see that the self-honesty then really becomes the foundation of the relationship? It's and also it's, liberating. Oh, so liberating. That's what I'm, the unapologetic part. It is absolutely liberating because it's no one can ever accuse you five years down the line saying, well, I didn't know you were a, a topless dancer. You know, you've already said, oh, and there was a part of my life where I was a chocolate dancer. Right? Well, I was going more along the lines of I'm a gourmet chef. No, Sarah, you are not. But you are a very good creative assembler of different tastes. You know, it's like, you know, inventive. But no, gourmet, mm, no, I can no. appreciate it. But I, but it also takes, it's like, you don't have to be the best at everything. You don't have to be somebody else's vision of what you should be you know like you were talking about being the good catholic girl with success mm -hmm. but that comes with so much attached to it and and what if you're not that person you know? absolutely and i think and the reason i threw out the thing about the top of the stancer is often people have something like that in their history something not not that but you know something like be that but it might be you know whatever it was and yeah. they're afraid to bring that forth when they're when they're you know in their third month of dating or and they're getting serious and and the point is if you become okay with all parts of you not that you might not regret some things or wish some certain things hadn't happened but they're part of you regardless so when you make friends with that you make friends with yourself and all the parts of yourself and then you're able to say and and then when it's six months down the line you're building a relationship built on authenticity not on idealization of yourself or the other person. Well, I could imagine a partner or someone you're building that relationship could feel tricked. It's like, if you didn't trust me, and this is me, if our relationship means as much, why don't you share this? Oh, and you would not believe, Sarah, the degree of trickery that brings people of all levels in to see me and the degree of dishonesty I've seen in my life where it's, and sometimes, you know, somebody wants a partner so much, they'll say or do anything and disguise a complete history. And then when it gets unpacked, you know, three, four, five year, seven years later, whatever it is, it ultimately comes up. And the healing that is required at a later date is so much more intense, if it's possible at all, than if the people had been up front from the get-go. Oh, yes. The whole, as you're told when you're a little kid, honesty is better. And yet, we don't and always yet. follow that. Okay, but you did bring up your book. 
um, date smart. And I know you've got another book coming out, but I wanted to ask you a question about that because in that book, you talk about these different mindsets, these 33 different mindset shifts to foster our communication, our boundaries, our expectations. Can you share a couple of those and the power of them or how we might integrate? Absolutely. One of the, um, I'll, I'll read you for the book. So it's actually here. This is the book and the mindset shifts are easily accessible in the back. So I'll give you one of my favorites. So for example, here's, I'll just pick one. Oh, um, that's actually one of the facts. Mindset shift. Um, it takes two. Not having your feelings return can hurt, but it truly takes the connection of two minds and hearts to make a relationship work. You can't make someone love you or even like you. So rejection is not about you. If someone passes on connecting or moving forward with you, it's simply a matter of where this person has their head and heart at any given time. And that's just an example of one of them, which Rejection is such a big issue. It's one of the reasons many people lie because they want to give a false front and they don't want to be rejected. And so what I tell people in my dog, Freedom, actually showed up at the right time in this book. He's a giant schnauzer. When I see and I walk every day with him and he's actually in the book because he taught me this lesson. Some people like he he's so lovely. He loves everybody, every dog, every person. I've never seen a dog like it, like him. And some people will shy away, some dogs will bark at him, and some will just come up and prance around him. There's no telling. But that's what it's like being in dating or relationships. Some people will like you and see your beauty, your, you know, your soul, and other people will bark at you, and some people will just you'll be invisible. And the point is, when you're going out into the world, whether it's for business or relationship, if you're showing up as your best self, and somebody does not appreciate that or, you know, want to be close to you, it's not about you. Because all you can do is show up and be your best self. And if and so many of my clients, when they start with me, they're suffering from rejection issues from a past relationship or something at work. And so I think that is it just, you know, it just happens to be one that I pulled up. But it's um such an important thing to remember when you're showing up as your best self in any place on the planet, that that's all you need to do. And if someone does not mirror you with a smile and joy, they're some, it's on them. Don't make it about you. It's on them. So that's one of them. Another one is um, have the courage, mindset shift 18, have the courage to walk away. Many times we can make the biggest difference by having the courage to stand up for ourselves and by refusing to be part of a problematic relationship. Although it can be difficult to leave a stuck or toxic situation, your better self will thank you for having the strength to walk away from a relationship that is less than what you deserve. It's a really good example of the parity between business world and relationship world. When you come to know who you are and that you deserve more, like I did in my marriage and in my first life and the work I did, then walking away becomes so much easier. Not that it's not painful, not that it's not sad, not that it's not hard, but you realize, wait a second, this is where courage, where I need to stand up for me, for my life, and move forward. And so it's that way, whether you're dating so many people in the dating and romantic world, take on relationships that they know aren't right for them. And they don't want to fail, or they want to be loved, or they want somebody to cuddle with and have sex with. And it, it, But they, they're coming to me saying, this isn't right, this isn't right, I'm stuck, I, you know, the person is abusive, or whatever. And it's about, it takes courage. It takes courage to dive in, to know yourself, and then to stand up and create a new life. And I personally believe, and my life, that's why I love that I've been through all of this. The universe watches over us. When we have the strength to stand in our truth, the universe just, and be ready to, to walk, the universe, I think, really recognizes it. And I'm not big on the whole law of attraction because some people mean that can, that means I can sit in my house and make money come or make the right 
No person. can do. No, no can do. Attraction no. requires some action. Uh, absolutely. And that first action is what am I worth? What do I have to offer? So those are just a couple of examples. Another one of the mindset shift. I love this one. It'll be the last one I'll share. I love this one. Okay. Mindset shift number 11. Our scars can be our greatest treasures. The very things we hide from others are sometimes the very things that make us most precious and valuable. The scars we strive so hard to conceal can be reminders of the wounds that we have worked so hard to understand and heal. These healed or healing wounds and the resulting scars can be among our finest treasures. They needn't be embarrassments, for they can signify how much we have learned, how much we have loved, and how far we have come. So that's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful and so true. Oh, so true. Mm. Some of the things that people cover up. And, you know, when when I hear, you know, I'm so blessed because people share their treasures with me, their soul treasures. And I'm looking at him saying, it was just so beautifully said. I wish I could just like spread it through the world because these scars that people think make them so broken or unacceptable or unlovable are, they're, they're sacred. And when you're sharing them with someone who is honorable and good and who will hold those treasures for you, it is that part to me that it just makes, it's, it's, it's the yummy part of being alive. It's that heart to heart connection. Yeah. Yeah. And, and seeing beyond the, the illusion of the surface. Oh. And the illusion of perfection which is actually the working title of my next book, not The Illusion of Perfection. But the oh, I like that of, title. The Illusion of Perfection. <laughs> I really, that resonates. It's actually a good one. It's actually The Joy of Imperfect Love. Okay. And But The Illusion of Perfection is, is a good one. And so when we learn that we are all imperfect and that we load our relationships with so many illusions, about what we should be, what the other person should be, that that's a big part of what makes things go awry. Yeah. Do you think that there's ever a time in relationship when we aren't discovering and uncovering even more of our illusions about one another, like at, even at a very subtle level, like, wow, I, I didn't realize I still expected you to do X, Y, and Z, or I... Or, you know, do you know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're, I think, I know, I think I know what you're saying that it's, I believe that the more complicated of a past you have had and the more trauma, big T and little T trauma that you've had and the less work you've done. So those who have more trauma and less work tend to require much more of this ongoing epiphany, 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 epiphany. I think that when we, even if we've had trauma, big T, little T, and we do our work, sometimes it comes out a lot at first and then it diminishes, diminishes, still always there. And then I think for people who are pretty, the, the, the few and far between who have no trauma, who have no undone or not any big undone baggage, you know, un unpacking that for them, it's more just like, okay, oh, this is an epiphany hmm, about me or about you. And I think that that's some of the magic of life is that you get to see all of these little, you think you've known someone for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and then you realize, oh, I'm doing that again, or she's doing that again, or he's doing that again. What does that say about me? What does that say about you? So I think that that is a lifelong process. If we tend to be self-reflective and other, you know, reflecting on others, I think that because we, I firmly believe we change every day. We change whether we're consciously aware of it, not whether we engage in intentional change or we let the world change us. We're changing every day. So, of course, we're going to keep having, if we're aware, we're going to keep having these little epiphanies. And again, I think they're smaller epiphanies if we're doing our work. Well, they're not life shattering it by any means, but there we go. Not they're one of those things that you go, oh, isn't that cool? I never thought that would be an opportunity. And Partly, I'm wondering why I didn't, you know, like, why didn't I think that? So um, 
yeah, they're not like, oh my God, this is a crisis. It's more of like, hmm, what if this instead of that? Yeah. You know, I mean, it keeps things fresh and curious. It's curious, you know, curiosity. Intriguing. And I think the looking at when you're saying not life shattering, I think one of the things that curiosity does is keeps us in touch with those in our lives. And I think if we lose curiosity, that is where something often, not that it's always this way, but where something life shattering can occur, where we are so immersed in our own life or what we think our partner's doing or should be doing. And then we come home and find them in the bedroom with the with the neighbor or something like that, right? And I think things like that are again not saying it's okay not okay by any means to you know be deceptive with your partner but sometimes that lack of curiosity of staying connected of really keeping those conversations going about what's working for you what's not working for you what's going on in your world what's you know and i think that again going back to curiosity and honesty it is one of the pieces with our relationships mm -hmm. where i see it with partners who come to me when an infidelity's happened and it's you know really rocked their worlds and it's always on the person who's unfaithful because no one can make you be unfaithful Right. But it is about, uh, you know, because I hear that, well, he wouldn't have sex with me or she wasn't giving me any attention. Well, then bring it to the table. Let's get curious about it. Right. Let's get honest. And, here. Uh, pardon me. Let's get honest. Yeah, let, let's get on let's get curious yep. about why this seemed like a good option at the time. Oh, yeah. 2020 hindsight well, it was never a good option. I was just too. I was not curious or courageous enough to bring it up. Yeah. You know, so I think what you've touched on today, Dr. Carla, is so powerful. But I do not want to let you think I forgot. I want to finish up by talking about soul family and how you found your soul family. What? It, tell me first what it means. Okay. For me, soul family is the most important kind of family because soul family is a, it's lasting and it's based on emotional connection, spiritual connection. And I, you know, I grew up again, big family, and I never felt like I was part of the family. In fact, my mom would sometimes say, now I see it's a little dose of cruelty there. You were found on the doorstep. The postman delivered you. And I think I always felt like an outsider. I didn't think like my family. I didn't act like looked like them and that's pretty much where it stopped but when I was in my doctoral program I met people for the first time in my life I loved them I couldn't explain it I was just wanting to hug them all and be in their arms and that I mean I just I can't, I can't I just loved them and it's more the women there were some of the men that I was just like wow you think like I do you act like I do your energy is like my energy first time in my life that I ever experienced that and I wasn't a person who understood soul or you know i understood religion and the catholic religion but i didn't under and i didn't and then the books i was reading you know at the time were just they were food for my soul i was like i didn't know this existed i didn't know this existed and so to me and the people in my doctoral program i'm still friends with many of them and it is that connection that no matter how long in between the times you see each other it's my heart knows yours my soul knows yours we are, we are one. And the energy of those, you know, my whole co cohort, uh, almost all of them, they're very much about doing good in the world, about being good souls, about showing up and being authentic. And I, I, yes, changed my life, changed my world, changed, maybe I found home. Do you think we all have a soul family, whether we have met them yet or not? I believe that we all do. And I think that when we are willing to go beneath the surface, because we often get so focused on the external what kind of car do you drive? What's your profession? Where's your house? You know, 
where do you shop and we or what's your dna right but to me dna does not honestly to me it's not nearly nearly as bonding i work with so many dna families where they're they don't even like each other they people do not like each other soul family always loves each other may have differences may have differences of course but there's a connection of love and so i believe that if we are courageous and curious to use your words courageous and curious and we are willing to go out and get past the physical and into it's kind of that sense when you meet someone and you're like i know you my soul knows you my soul knows you and it's that sense of ah oh, and that's why i say i want to be in your arms to me there are certain people i meet and i'm just like oh you're and so I know they're part of my soul family, at least on some level. They may not be, you know, this, this close, but some level. And I also think that there are, I'm thinking of um, when I teach yoga, people will sometimes, someone will say something like, well, she has to be a soulful person. She goes to yoga. <laughs> he has to be a good person. He meditates. I'm thinking, well, some people meditate just because they want to meditate it doesn't make you soulful or not soulful and some people go to yoga because it's a form of exercise and they think they look cute in their yoga clothes or whatever it is right <laughs> that we really have to get beyond the superficial if we're wanting to create a family a lasting family is find the people who treat you and that's a big piece of of this book the date smart book transform your relationships and love fearlessly it's not just for people who are dating it's a common sense book about finding your people, making your relationships built on friendships. And if people aren't treating you, and I get very deep on the word friendship, I think like relationships, the word friendship covers far too many sins, right? And people will say, but my best friend did this and this and thing. Oh, she lied to you. She tricked you. She violated your boundaries. And this is your definition of friend. So we get curious about what friendship means to that person, right? We have to look at how is someone showing up? How are they acting? And not that we're ever perfect, but when we make mistakes, we want to say, hey, I'm sorry. I apologize. Let me do it better next time. And so to me, that is a big piece about soul family is soul family. I, I believe we find our soul family when they're on the same trajectory with us about trying to be better people. Agreed. And you're so right that you can meet somebody and think, don't know why, but we are connected deep. Yeah. And that's such a great feeling. Oh, oh, it's, it's, it's yummy. It's sometimes not always like sparkly. Some people you think it always has to have sparkle. To me, it's almost just like this magnetic and it doesn't happen all that often. No. But when you find that, it's like, ah, uh, and ideally, so when people talk about finding your soulmate, ideally, we find that in a partner. And sometimes when we meet a partner, and there is that soul connection, especially if there's a lot of trauma, that is the opportunity for us to heal our trauma if both people have enough courage and curiosity and tenacity and kindness and love to work through that so that the trauma can unravel in the context of the relationship. Well, this has been a very deep conversation <laughs> balanced on the uh, edge of curiosity. So Dr. Carla, I'm gonna give you the final word as we sign off. What, as we're wrapping up 2022, hard to believe, or in the last quarter of it, but as we're wrapping this up, what is a thought that you would encourage us to take into 2023? Into 2023. I'm big on mindsets, right? And I would say, notice your mindsets. We have so little power in the world in the outside world, that if we pay attention to our mindset of how we are going about something, are we choosing kindness? Are we choosing love? Are we choosing hope? Are we choosing joy? All of those are parts of our mindset. So as you go into 2023, especially knowing how, how rocky the world can be at times, remember the power of your mindset has the power to change not only your day, 
about your life. So whether it's political issues or, you know, the state of the economy or the state of the world and global warming, it's like, wait a second, I might not be able to change the big picture, but I can paint change my little picture, which is big in its own way. I can, if I'm worried about the state of the environment, I'll pick up trash. I pick up trash all the time. People always go, ooh, you're picking that up? Yeah, I'm picking that up. Um, so, you know, notice that with the power of your mindset, you can change your world and the bigger world one step at a time. So mindset. Thank you so much. And listeners, if you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with someone else and take one idea that you learned from Dr. Carla and share it with someone else, teach it to someone else, explain it to someone else. So that'll anchor deeper into you. And we want to welcome you to come back. For those of you who want to know how to follow Dr. Carla, more about her books, all of that will be in the show notes as always. So don't worry about it. Just look down below. You'll have all the links and info and reach out to Dr. Carla. And she has another book coming. Yay. So we'll be looking forward to that. Thanks so much. My pleasure. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash No Labels, No Limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.